Okay, hey, this is Wednesday, and that should be time for a quiz, don't you think? <laughs> so, um, what was Lucifer's great loss? One word. I'm, I'm hearing things, but I'm not sure I'm hearing the, the one I'm looking for. What did he lose that started the cascade of the dominoes of faith? faith. There we go. Faith. Faith is a big deal. Ask a qualified theologian, and I think he'd agree with me. Faith is a big thing. Okay. What was the most severe limitation on Christ's ability to reveal the character of his father? He, he could not do it through words alone. And lest it be any surprise to you, I think maybe on Friday I'll have a statement that says that you can't either. <laughs> I found that the number of things that I can do successfully that Christ could not is very limited. <laughs> so if, if he could not reveal the Father through words alone, I'm, I'm just, just a hot tip, you probably can't either. That may require some adjustment in our thinking. I think that's great. Let's make an adjustment and go on. Okay. Today, we, we move on. We started with Lucifer's Rebellion, right? We jumped 4,000 years, roughly, to the life of Christ. We're going to jump, yeah, you know, not quite another 2,000. And we're going to be looking today at uh, probably, well, hey, I'm in Michigan. You guys should know about this fella, if anybody knows about this fella. A guy by the name of John Harvey Kellogg he used to hang out down in Battle Creek someplace. You know, it's funny, with all my, uh, all my interest in Adventist history, I've never yet made it to Battle Creek. It's a little weird. Someday I will. Notice the title here. What converted people do? There's an important note I need to explain, and then I'm going to... We're going to have to go pretty quickly because there's a, a lot of reading and be less talking today. But... Um, one thing to understand is that in the, the time flow of events, different perspectives often overlapped, okay? So, to be honest, today we're going to be looking at the cheery side of things. There won't be too much that, you know, will, will bring any, uh, any, any frowns or, or tears. Most of it's going to be happy today. That doesn't mean that there weren't some sad and unpleasant things happening at the same time. Okay, one of the things that is really fascinating is uh, when you're reading through Ellen White's letters, especially, is the way that she did her very best to tailor a letter to the recipient. And so you'll find that when she wrote to, for instance, Dr. Kellogg, she often dwelt on the things where he needed to pull his socks up a bit. <laughs> but when she wrote to those who had a tendency to give Kellogg a bad time, she dwelt on all the good things he was doing. <laughs> There's no sense giving somebody ammunition, you know? And, and when others made mistakes, you wouldn't find that in the letters to Kellogg. You'd find their good points. You know, you could look at that and say, she's not being honest. You could do that if you want to. I think she was being smart, and I encourage the practice. <laughs> Let's not be bad-mouthing people too much, okay? <laughs> okay, what converted people do? So Dr. Kellogg is without doubt the most colorful character that Adventism has ever produced. We can get distracted with a thousand different stories, and I will resist that diligently because it's just too much fun and we have to get through this today, so I won't. Uh, we'll be dealing with basically what I colloquially refer to as the good Kellogg years, okay? So we have to have a starting point, and here is the starting point for our purposes. In October into November of 1888, there was a ministerial institute and a general conference session held at Minneapolis. 
Now, those of you who've dabbled in Adventist history to any degree will recognize this as the famous 1888 Minneapolis General Conference, right? A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, the Ten Horns, the, the uh, well, what else? The Law and Galatians, you know, G.I. Uh, Butler, Uriah Smith, that whole deal, right? Okay, 1888 message, that's what we're talking about. Um, that's probably the most discussed, debated, written about event in Adventist history. One minor, no, 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 I won't say that. One overlooked major factor that came out of that is this little note. After the meeting at Minneapolis, Dr. Kellogg was a converted man. And we all knew it. We could see the converting power of God working in his heart and life. Well, now, given my sometimes irreverent personality, I don't mean that in too serious a sense, but, you know, I, I have a curiosity, right? So the first thing I think of is, what was different? How could they tell the guy was converted now? It's not like he was just baptized. He'd been an Adventist all, well, pretty much all his life. He'd been the medical director of the sanitarium for, what year is this, 88, for 12 years already. Um... It's, it's not like he was new. So, you know, I went looking. What was different? Well, to make it nice and simple, he started being nice to people. That's a good thing. And it fits very nicely with the inspired counsel. When the believer is justified because of the merit of Christ, he is not free to work on righteousness. Faith works by love and purifies the soul. Faith buds and blossoms and bears a harvest of precious fruit. Where faith is, good works appear. The sick are visited, the poor are cared for, the fatherless and the widows are not neglected, the naked are clothed, the destitute are fed." That last sentence there is what converted people do. And so when Kellogg was converted, it wasn't a big surprise that he started doing that kind of thing. One more statement along that line. Faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the one who pardons our sins and transgressions, the one who is able to keep us from sin and lead us in his footsteps, is set forth in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Here are presented the fruits of a faith that works by love and purifies the soul from selfishness. Faith and works are here combined. Notice that word. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. She's quoting there from Isaiah 58. And she asks, what does this mean? It means Christ is our righteousness. There is a link, lest anyone should doubt, between good works and righteousness by faith. And Kellogg was converted at the famous 1888 Righteousness by Faith General Conference. What would you expect to see? And so at the General Conference of 1891, Dr. Kellogg was making a presentation. In between, well, let's put it this way, in the summer of 1890, he had gone up to Pet Petoskey? Petoskey. Oski, Oski, Petoski. Okay, he had gone to Petoski. I remember pronouncing that once, and somebody laughed at me, so I must have got it wrong. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, and he had met Ellen White up there, and he had asked her a fairly simple question. He said, S "Sister White, should we start an orphanage at Battle Creek?" Well, it's a fascinating story from there on out. Ellen White wrote a letter back to the. Uh, saints in Battle Creek and said, I've had some conversation with your physician-in-chief about this matter of an orphanage. I said that we were years behind in this, and it was a great idea. If I remember right, she used 45 words in that sentence. There's an additional 2,300 words in that same letter, which cover every problem that developed in Battle Creek over the next 12 years. Kellogg should have read the whole letter and kept it all in mind, but unfortunately, he kind of focused on one part, as we often do. I'm not trying to be hard on the guy, but he, uh, you know, he may have had some things a little out of balance, but he did certainly have the Lord's 
authorization to start an orphanage. So at the General Conference of 1891, he gets up and he says this. I have given quite a good deal of thought and study to this subject. My wife and I have given considerable attention to this work for a number of years. We have been planning to raise 40 or 50 children ourselves. Just as fast as we get any money, we will invest it in children. I've done that for several years. Every single dollar that can be saved from other necessary expenses goes into the education of children. I do not believe we have any right to accumulate money. I think as long as we are well and have God's blessing upon our work, it is our duty to spend what we earn in God's work. I do not believe that in this age any man has a right to accumulate money. Now, for most people reading over that, there are two things that kind of stand out. <laughs> Was he really serious about either of those two things? Well, I don't know all the details of his financial accounts, but he and his wife did raise 42 children. 18 were legally adopted. The rest would be more or less what we would call foster children or something like that today. So he was certainly reasonably serious about the 40 to 50 kids. And he set a pretty good example when it comes to the money. He, he never really accepted a salary from the sanitarium, as I understand it. He, he earned his money off of the books that he wrote. I don't know how he did that. It's not easy to do that today. <laughs> you just can't get rich writing books. Not that that's the goal, but anyhow. Anyhow. Um, <clears throat> just remember those two thoughts there. You know, we'll have reason to come back to those a little bit. Further on in that, uh, in that session, the 1891 session, he used a, a Bible verse that I know I have read prior to seeing him call attention to it because I've read, you know, you do a little yearly thing or whatever, you know, I've read, I've read through the Bible, I know that, but I never noticed the verse before. It's a great verse. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, capital H, will pay back what he, little h, has given. And Kellogg had a, um, had a colorful way of driving this point home. He said, if I came to you and asked, may I borrow $10, and you were kind enough to lend it to me, what now? What has changed in our relationship? I now owe you $10 because you lent to me, right? Are we good on that? The one who receives the loan now owes it back. And so he said, how would you like to have God in your debt? You can have God in your debt. Because he promised to pay back the loan when you have pity on the poor. That caught my attention. That was really an interesting way of putting that. Okay. What Kellogg was doing in all this, I would argue, is simply encouraging the church to take seriously the teaching of the, quotes, 1888 message. Jones and Wagner had certainly shaken things up a bit with their message that Jesus was all that was needed. Jesus was what you needed. He could supply your need. He could take care of you. He, would, he could forgive you. He could justify you. He could sanctify you. He was everything that you needed. You could rest assured if you had Christ. And though I've never found the doctor putting it in these kind of words... It appears to me that what he said is, that's great, and I have Christ. That's everything I need, so I can spend my life working to help others. And for several years, that seems to be what he did. It would be the practical component, the applied theology of the 1888 message. Well, <clears throat> in 1891, Kellogg made a motion at the General Conference. He said, I move that we start an orphanage here in Battle Creek. 
And that motion was passed. They formed a committee. I think there were like nine people on the committee or something like that. And, and you know, it's not... It's a lot of work, but it's not rocket science, right? You raise some money, you buy some property, you build a building, you bring in the kids, you hire, you hire staff, you bring in the kids, and you, t- you take care of them, right? You know, I mean, everybody knew what needed to happen. Well, a year went by, and what became apparent was that the church was not particularly enthusiastic about donating for this project. So after a year, they had enough money to buy a piece of property out on the west end of Battle Creek, But they didn't have any money to build, and it was starting to get sticky because there was one group that was very enthusiastic about the new orphanage that was going to be built in Battle Creek, and that was the kind of scattered group of individuals who were caring for orphans that they didn't really want. And so kids began to show up at the train station with a little note pinned on their shirt, Bobby, four years old, orphanage, Battle Creek. After about a year, Kellogg had 20 to 25 of these mostly very young children. He rented a couple of cottages out behind the sanitarium, and he'd go in now and then and raid nurses to come out and care for the havoc that was being created out there. And he began to get desperate, and he said, God, I need a lot of money, and I need it right away. And this is my interpretation. I try to be charitable. Maybe this is too harsh. I think it's safe to say that there were probably a lot of people in Battle Creek that would have been just as happy to see the whole thing fold up and go away. And then a Mrs. Carolyn Haskell came along and donated $30,000, the largest single donation ever received up to that time by any element aspect of the denomination. And with $30,000, they built this. If you ever have any questions as to what inflation does to the purchasing value of your money, (laughs) you might gauge it by this particular feature right here. I don't think you could buy the doorknobs for $30,000. I know you couldn't buy the windows. (laughs) Okay. This was the Haskell Home for Orphan Children. It was all paid for by Mrs. Carolyn Haskell, who was not a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, about the same time, there was a 16-year-old girl who came from Chicago. She was quite sick. She spent a period of time, I think it was about six weeks, at the sanitarium. And then for reasons that I I haven't been able to find out, she needed an operation, and she went back down to Chicago to have the operation. Why exactly that would be, I don't know. Dr. Kellogg was, I think, just at the beginning stages right then of setting the world record for thoracic surgeries without a fatality. This was in an era when 20 to 25 percent, the moment you would slice into the thorax, 20 to 25 percent of your patients were expected to be dead. He went, I think it was 136 or something like that without a fatality. Well, the young lady, nonetheless, maybe there was somebody who was specialized in that operation or something, I don't know what it was, but she went down to Chicago, had the operation. It was beyond the surgeon's skill. He sewed her back up and everyone knew she was going to die. On her deathbed, she pled with her father, and she said, Daddy, I want you to do something as a memorial for me. There are no nurses anywhere on this earth like the nurses in that sanitarium up in Battle Creek. I want you to put up the money to bring a nurse to work for the poor people of Chicago. Well, the young lady died. The father wrote a letter. Kellogg was busy. He ignored it. The father wrote a second letter. Kellogg was still busy. He was pretty routinely busy. He ignored that one, too. Father wrote a third letter. Kellogg ignored that. And then the father got, I don't know, lucky or smart, take your pick. He had his wife write a letter. Kellogg had a soft spot for moms. (laughs) Who can turn down mom? So he marched over to the sanitarium, and he, uh, um, he located... uh, what was commonly considered uh, the the lady, the the nurse there, who was commonly considered one of the best nurses. I'm looking for her name. Her last name was Schranz. I can't think of it right now. I don't see if I have any notes here. Anyhow, he located his nurse and said, would you be willing to go to Chicago and work for the poor people? And she said yes. And out of that came the visiting nurses program, which was also incidentally funded by non-Adventists. In November of 1892, this is all happening in 1892, in November of that year, I believe it was the 
first or second Friday night of the month. I forget the exact date. Dr. Kellogg gathered a bunch of people in the sanitarium cafeteria, and he, he gave them a, a sales pitch on a new plan that he developed. He said, let's start Christian help bands. So, okay, what's a Christian help band? It's a very technical issue. A Christian help band is a band of Christians who try to help people. And so that night, they organized Christian help band number one. So fascinating interconnections. It turned out they chose as leader of Christian help band number one, a Australian chap by the name of A.W. Simmons. And his story is fascinating to follow, but we won't be having time to do that today here. Um, what the Christian help bands did is they were given a certain block of, you know, this street to that street and this avenue to that avenue. That's your part of town. Your job is to find out every serious need in that town. Is somebody sick? Has somebody, you know, been laid off? They don't have work? Uh, you know, do they, are they poor? Do they have enough coal? Are they going to freeze to death this winter? Which was, you know, always an option in that part of the world. Um, and to help them. And so that started up too. Three programs... San, the, of course, sanitarium was already going, but the orphanage, the visiting nurses program, and the Christian help bands, all in 1892, all under Dr. Kellogg's auspices. One more thing of specific interest that happened that year was that on November 22, 1892, Ellen White's comment was printed in the review that said, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. This is the high water mark of Christian attainment as, a, as the, the, the church as a body. This is the closest we've ever come to finishing the work God's given us to do, is the beginning of the loud cry noted by the prophet in 1892. We have traditionally very understandably, but I would say somewhat regrettably, we have traditionally seen that as the result of the theology of Jones and Wagner. I would not dispute that. But I would argue at great length, <laughs> if need be, that the theology alone was not sufficient. It was the revelation, note the word she uses there, she does not say the proclamation of the righteousness of Christ, she says the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. And that can only be done through deeds and actions, just as it was done by Christ himself. And so I would argue that Dr. Kellogg is as integral a component in the beginning of the loud cry as were elders Jones and Wagner. Another couple of years later, they had a general conference in 1893. Well, not later than that. It was just actually about three and a half months after that statement was made, but a couple of years after the 1891, okay? The 1893 general conference session. Um, this one is, you know, famous. There's the dates. It's famous because Elder A.T. Jones presented a 24-part series of studies on the third angel's message, which went from start to finish of the session. Uh, that's a great series of, of sermons. It's reprinted at least three times that I know of and, you know, probably due for another printing. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It's a great series. There was something else that happened, though. Dr. Kellogg presented a series of eight talks on medical missionary work between February 5 and 15. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is that for reasons which... I'm not even going to try to explain because I don't know for certain, but I have, you know, well-established, you know, hunches. For a variety of reasons, perhaps, nothing that Dr. Kellogg said was reported in the General Conference Bulletin. It was lost sight of for 110, 115 years, basically. Um, through a convoluted series of providential events spanning 28 years, which started when I was hitchhiking from Colorado to Washington and got one ride that took me all the way by way of Southern California. I know that's convoluted. Anyhow, 28 years later, because of that hitchhiking ride, um, I inherited um, 32 boxes of, of manuscripts that came to me. And in there, I found... 
the sermons that Dr. Kellogg, or actually only three of the sermons that Dr. Kellogg preached at that 1893 general I had never heard of them before. I knew from the dates it was in the middle of the general conference session. Well, where'd this come from? I looked through the general conference bulletin. I looked online. I looked, I, I actually remembered I have an original copy of that. I looked through that. It's not there. The only m- notice of it you'll find is actually on the very first page of general conference bulletin. It says, Dr. Kellogg will be giving a series of talks on medical missionary work in the afternoons. Beyond that, blank. Well, they were eventually published in, okay, in that magazine. You'll notice it's an extra. Um, It mentions an extra number two, which I have never yet found. If anybody finds the medical missionary extra number two from probably sometime in about March of 1893, do please let me know. <laughs> I would very much like to see that. But this one we, we managed to locate and get, get our fingers on, okay? But because of that oversight or that omission from the General Conference Bulletin, the work of medical missionary work there, I hit the wrong button, come on, let's go this way, there we go. Um, okay, something's gone with my clicker, let's try this button instead. It just vanished. It just vanished. Even Willie White, writing several years later, he says, the beginnings of Christian help work under this name date from the year 1893. Although the printed addresses of the 1893 General Conference include no talk by Dr. Kellogg on this phase of gospel work, evidently there was something said for the 62nd resolution of the 1893 Conference reads as follows and mentions Christian help work. That's all Willie knew. Of course, he was in Australia at the time, so he wasn't at, in attendance. But that's all he knew. He, I don't know. I never heard what Kellogg said. So what did he say? Well, he started off talking about good works. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, notice the end of the third line. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Yes, isn't that sweet? I like that. But, it, you know, it can be a little confusing. If I'm supposed to be enjoying all things that God gives me, what's this stuff about giving and sharing? How can I enjoy something if I give it away? And the answer is actually quite simple. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The enjoyment comes from the giving, not from the having. (laughs) He used a lot of Bible verses. We won't cover them all. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs. I like this. This is a defining clause right here. Or, yeah, it's a phrase, actually, a prepositional phrase. It's a defining phrase. What are good works meeting urgent needs? And I would caution you against meeting frivolous needs. Doesn't qualify. It's not wise. It doesn't further the gospel. Can you follow me on that? Urgent needs, important needs, legitimate needs. Yes, you should be there. Frivolous needs? No, not so much. There's a fine line there. You'll have to work that one out for yourself. There's a lot of spirit of prophecy counsel that direction, though. You can probably find it and figure it out. That he, capital H, might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Then Kellogg went on to say in Acts 10.38, Peter tells us that Christ went about doing good. It is evident then that if we are Christ's servants, if we follow Christ, we must also go about doing good. We are not to wait for the opportunities for doing good to come to us, but we must go about doing good, seeking opportunities to to do good, to help the needy, to bless and comfort the sorrowing, to uplift the fallen. We must search them out, not wait for them to hunt us up and move us to action by their appeals. We are not to be narrow in our charities. For Paul says to us in Galatians 6.10, let us do good unto all men. It is true, he adds, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, 
But this does not excuse us from doing good to those who are not of the household of faith, for he says all men. And certainly we cannot hide behind his, this apology, for we have not been good even to those belonging to the household. Oh, that uh, brings a little bit of a darker flavor to the comment here. What's he talking about? Who had they not been good to? The orphans. And the, the aged, today, today we would call them the senior citizens, the retired. Kellogg wanted to address both of those issues. He says, for years and years we have been well able to furnish a home for the aged, the infirm, the homeless, for poor widows, worn out ministers, aged pilgrims and helpless children, members of our denomination, old pioneers in the cause who gave liberally of their property in the early days when the work was just beginning and whose faith in the truths which we profess has led them to put all their earnings into the cause instead of hoarding up a competency for themselves. All these worthy and deserving ones who appeal to us on fraternal as well as humanitarian grounds, we have neglected in a manner which has become a denominational disgrace. Okay, that's a little bit pointed. <laughs> but let's work on the vocabulary. So five lines up from the bottom, near the right-hand side, what is that big, long 25-cent word mean? Do you find it? Competency. What would be our synonym today? A retirement fund. Exactly. A competency was an amount of money competent or suitable to keep me alive for the rest of my life or keep me fed or clothed or something, whatever the needs might be. Kellogg's saying something quite radical here. He's saying, as he said earlier, I don't believe anyone has the right to accumulate money. As long as you are well and the Lord is blessing you, you should use your money in His work. Now, that poses an interesting problem. What about those retirement years? Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that Kellogg had the perfect balance in this, but it does make for an interesting question. Well, okay. <clears throat> Kellogg's saying that there were all these people. And there certainly were. You know, that whole first generation of the, well, probably second generation too, you could count, of the Adventist pioneers, they had no retirement funds. So, you know, yeah. And it kind of comes back to the same question Lucifer started with, incidentally. Will God take care of me? Is he smart enough? Does he love me enough to take care of me? We might ask the same question of our brethren, <laughs> the collective body of the church. Will the church take care of me? That's kind of God's hand in many ways for his work on earth today. Well, Kellogg continued. Now, these next few slides, you'll see some text in red. That's where Kellogg is quoting Ellen White, okay? Just, just so you can keep that straight. He quotes, we have seen the widowed mother with her fatherless children working far beyond her strength in order to keep her little ones with her and prevent them from suffering for food and clothing. Many a mother has thus died from overexertion. Now, you remember I told you Kellogg had a soft spot for mothers, right? A mother who has the true instincts of self-respect will not go from door to door begging. She will suffer rather than complain. And because people do not complain, because they do not clamor for assistance, we do not stop to think that they may be suffering. We seldom inquire after them. Now, this is simply my comment. I think society has, um, has changed somewhat in the last 120 years or so. And society at large has become much better at clamoring for assistance. Uh, in fact, some of that clamoring represents frivolous needs rather than urgent needs. I'm not sure that's an overall benefit to society, but I think it's something that anyone who wants to engage in Christian help work ought to take into their calculation of things. Let's go on. How little has been done by us as a people for this class. Kellogg says, please think of that. That was said two years ago. <laughs> two. <laughs> two years ago. We haven't done it yet. It's been two years. What was this? 1893? Somebody do the math here for me. How many years has it been? 
Quoting Ellen White, how little has been done by us as a people for this class. For mothers, for widowed mothers, have we not come far short of our duty? We are not doing as much as is done by other denominations. Now, I don't say this. Don't blame me. That's a quote. That's Ellen White, Kellogg, you know, don't blame me. We have set ourselves up on a high pinnacle and say, we are God's special people. Our cause is the Lord's cause, and we talk about ourselves as being the peculiar people, and yet we are not doing as much Christian work and Christian work of a very important character as other denominations are doing. Again, it is right that more should be expected of us than of others. Now, the question is, whether Seventh-day Adventists are going to lead in this work or is it going to be left for someone else to do? The Lord has given us here a very precious work to do. It is not the whole of the third angel's message, but it is a part of it. You read in Isaiah 58, the great medical missionary chapter, how we can make our light shine. If thou draw thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Quoting, when the advocates of the law of God plant their feet firmly upon its principles, living out in their daily lives the spirit of the commandments and exercising true benevolence to men, then will they have power to move the world. That's a pretty sobering statement. Read with that, you know, just think that one through one more time, right? When we learn to exercise godly benevolence to men, then we will have power to move the world. Kellogg, we shall never have the moral power to move the world. We shall never see the loud cry nor make the third angel's message go to any great extent. We will never see it go so as to move the world at least until we carry out these truths in our daily lives. Now, I'm reading through this stuff, that I, uh, these, these sermons that I found in this trove of manuscripts that was bestowed upon me. And I got right there and I just gulped. The loud cry. Kellogg is linking medical missionary work to the success of the loud cry. How many of you recognize the name Robert Wheland? A few, at least, yeah. Elder Wheland was a relative of mine. And the very last time I had a conversation with him, we were discussing the loud cry and its rise and apparent fall. And I remember I said, Elder, I think there's something more than abstract theology. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, and what might that be, Dave? And I said, I don't know. And he very graciously, I mean, he could, have, he could have really kind of, you know, made me look dumb, but he was a very gracious man. He very, very graciously, he said, well, if you ever think of something, do call me. But in the meantime, I'll keep working with what I have. And I read this statement from Kellogg. He's tying medical missionary work, Isaiah 58, to the success of the loud cry. And it was like, how stupid could I be that I never thought of that? It was like, duh, obvious. <laughs> it, just, it just made so much sense. The sad news is that Elder Wheeland had died three months before. So I never had the chance to tell, tell him about it. Well, Kellogg goes on. We cannot get moral power to move the world until we get where we will do what the scriptures and the testimonies say we must do. We have not done it yet. We have waited for outside people to come in and build our orphan's home. That would be Mrs. Haskell. The Lord may be ready to start the loud cry, but we are not ready. We have not done our part, and the Lord is waiting for us to do something in the direction of good works. Now, lest you think that Dr. Kellogg is arguing against Ellen White, because three and a half months before she said the loud cry has begun, he's not arguing against Ellen White. He was perhaps Ellen White's strongest supporter in Battle Creek in 1893, at least. Ten years later, it'd be a different story, but in 1893, he was known as as the strongest supporter around for Ellen White. He's not arguing with her. He's saying that 
I wish he'd had a good editor. <laughs> I wish he'd, he'd gotten in touch with me on this one. Uh, he's, he's confusing the, the, full, the fullness of the loud cry with its very tiny beginnings that Ellen White was addressing. That's, that's the way I make sense out of this, okay? If we want the loud cry to begin, brethren... That is the place where it is going to begin. The loud cry is going to begin with our doing the things that the Lord in this chapter, Isaiah 58, says come before the loud cry. So he says we must draw out our soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. He says if we will do this, our light will shine. If we want the loud... Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, the gospel is... Okay, this is an Ellen White statement. I threw this in here. Sorry about that. I mixed myself all up. The bottom part is Ellen White. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation when it is interwoven with the practical life, when it is lived and practiced. The union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Again, a little grammar. The true interpretation, not a true interpretation. This is the definite article. This is the true interpretation, the union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul. All other interpretations of the gospel must of necessity be, to some degree, untrue. Okay, back to Kellogg. <clears throat> if the loud cry has been begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. But we've done so little in that way that it seems to me that before the loud cry will make any great noise in the world, we will have to let our light shine a great deal brighter than we have ever yet done because the works come first. The light must shine through these good works before we can be called the repairers, the breach, and the restorers, the paths to dwell in, for that promise comes after all these conditions, you see. I think Kellogg nailed it right there. Again, with a good editor, he might have been more clear. <laughs> if the loud cry has been begun by our people, as Ellen White had said, and he's not questioning that, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. What had they done? Well, the sanitarium, the orphanage, the visiting nurses, the Christian help bands. That was the beginning of the loud cry. How many times had the loud cry been noted on the front page of the New York Times? None, obviously. Had it been noted on the front page of the... What was that? I used to know what the Battle Creek paper was. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Had it ever made the newspaper in Battle Creek? No, it had not. Adventists themselves would not have known that the loud cry had begun if Ellen White hadn't said so. It wasn't making a lot of noise. But it was following the pattern, the union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul. Okay. Now, how important was this Kellogg guy? I can do this if I quit. Okay. Dr. Kellogg has done a work that no man I know of among us has had qualifications to do. That's nice. My dear brother, as I have before written to you, I know that the Lord has placed you in a very responsible position, standing as you do as the greatest physician in our world. Well, oh, that's, uh, nobody ever wrote me a letter like that. <laughs> God says of Dr. Kellogg, he is my physician. Respect him and sustain him. Dr. Kellogg, with earnest, untiring energy, has testified by his works that he believes the Word of God, and that he is not content to be merely a theoretical believer. He has put his belief into works. He has faith and works combined. He has undertaken to educate his students to do service for the Lord. In this, he has only tried to walk in the light. He has been doing the very work the Lord has specified should be done. The Lord has reproved those who claim to believe present truth for failing to cooperate with Dr. Kellogg and his faithful co-workers in walking the light of health reform. Dr. Kellogg is to stand as God's physician and is to do an exalted work. The Lord has given Dr. Kellogg his work. It is a fact that our ministers are very slow to become health reformers, notwithstanding all the light which the Lord has given upon this subject. This has caused Dr. Kellogg to lose confidence in them. Now, before we jump on the ministers too hard, what is this? Um, 
this is, I think this whole statement is going to be a 1903 statement. 1903, you try being a vegetarian when you're living an itinerant lifestyle. They didn't have refrigeration. They didn't even have blenders. How can you be a vegetarian without a Vitamix? <laughs> uh, the ministers were in a more challenging position. I, I, I want to cut them that much slack. Now, Ellen White says that they were kind of tardy, and yeah, they were. There were some ministers who specifically were, uh, what should I say? Uh, let's just say they were opposed to the health reform. They just, yeah, I'm not going down that road. Forget it. Doctors scoff on some weird tangent again. They should not have been, but they were. And sadly, this has caused Dr. Kellogg to lose confidence in them. You know, when I do something stupid, as occasionally happens, sometimes the worst effects are felt in someone else's life. That's a sobering thought. Their tardy work in health reform has created in him a spirit of criticism, and he has borne down on them in an unsparing manner, which the Lord does not sanction. He, Dr. Kellogg, has belittled the gospel ministry and in his regard and ideas has placed the medical mission work above the ministry. I have seen that in the censuring of ministers, remarks have been made which have not been to the honor and glory of God. Were the ministers all correct in their approach to health reform? No, some of them were not. That's not a call for unsparing censure. Sometimes, sometimes we take it upon ourselves to be a little hard on the brethren more than perhaps I think maybe we should. It's a tricky balance. How do you hold up the, the goal that God has placed before us and reprove and correct as necessary and yet not do it with unsparing censure, but do it in a way that will encourage and bring along those you're trying to win. <laughs> win, right? Well, okay. There were problems. This work, Kellogg's work, is the work that churches have left undone. And they cannot prosper until they have taken hold of this work in the cities, in highways, and in hedges then angels of God will cooperate with human instrumentalities and a religious system will be inaugurated to relieve the necessities of suffering human beings who are in physical, mental, and moral need. Now, I always point out that, you know, different personalities have different uh, approaches to life and there are some people who the, the thing they want the most, the, just, just the, the insatiable desire is to have a challenge. Well, you know, if that's you and you want a challenge, here's one for you. Try to get a church to prosper without taking hold of medical missionary work. You'll have a challenge. You will fail, but all your life you will have had a challenge. If that's what turns your crank, there you go. <laughs> Me, I, I like challenges, but I like challenges where I have a chance of success. <laughs> I'm not interested in taking on something that God says I cannot do. And trying to make a church prosper without taking hold of medical missionary work cannot be done. It's an important point. My brethren in America, Ellen White's writing from Australia, of course, in the place of questioning and criticizing Dr. Kellogg because he is doing the class of work he is, when you do your God-given service, you will be heart and soul engaged in doing the same kind of work, which will be of far more account in the sight of God than for so many to flock into Battle Creek where they become religious dwarfs because they do not do the work God has appointed them. Ow! <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty harsh language from Helen White. She, she seldom waxes quite that um, steamy, shall we say. <laughs> that over which Dr. Kellogg feels the deepest is that Seventh-day Adventists have made his work so hard. They have not taken any pains to become acquainted with his earnest, determined effort to train and educate workers. All who have reasoning minds ought to have seen that his work is far ahead 
of anything they have done or could do. <laughs> they should have been very careful how they placed additional burdens on him by ignoring the work which they should have been forward to share. Long story short, we never really came up to, uh, you know, we never really stepped up to the plate when it comes to medical missionary work. A couple quick one-liners here type of thing. This is not a fanatical and superstitious work. It is the work that Christ did when he was in the world. Dr. Kellogg has not betrayed his trust. The Lord has wrought with him in surgical operations, giving him wisdom and success. Men not of our faith feel that, although Dr. Kellogg is a Seventh-day Adventist, yet he has wisdom and knowledge and a wide influence. They feel it would be the height of folly to ignore this. The American Medical Association, in one of their official histories, classed Dr. Kellogg as the single most influential influential physician in American uh, medicine for a period of 40 years. That's, that says something. You need to practice health reform just as conscientiously as does Dr. Kellogg. Well, okay. <clears throat> How did Kellogg attain this success? Well, in 1891, he was talking to David Paulson, and he kind of told the story. This is Paulson's account of it. He said, uh, Paulson is saying that Kellogg said when a new thing is brought out in the medical world he knew from his knowledge of the spirit of prophecy whether it belonged in our system or not if it did he instantly adopted it and advertised it while the rest of the doctors were slowly feeling their way and when they finally adopted it he had five years the start of them on the other hand when the medical profession were swept off their feet by some new fad if it did not fit the light we had received he simply did not touch it when the doctors finally discovered their mistake they wondered how Dr. Kellogg did not get caught the success of Dr. Kellogg rose and fell with his adherence to the spirit of prophecy. There's a lesson there for some of the rest of us. I will leave you to figure it out. If Dr. Kellogg will trust himself wholly with God, he, capital H, will give him tact and perception and skill as a practitioner that has seldom been excelled. Angels of God will stand by his side when human life is in peril, and wisdom from above will be given him. God designs that Dr. Kellogg shall still advance. He has only begun to climb the ladder. The Lord will give him grace that he is now ignorant of, and he will see as he has never seen before. He will realize that there is to be an intelligent discarding of all drugs. Skill and knowledge is to be given him, which he is in no case to keep to himself. He is to educate Educate, educate. Okay, now if you're susceptible to hot button issues, you will no doubt have noticed those words right there. <laughs> Do notice the second highlighted word. <laughs> Just a little caution. I would argue that an intelligent time to discard a drug is when it's not the only thing that's keeping you alive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you have an equivalent or superior, quotes, whatever you want to call it, natural treatment, by all means, drop the drug. But this was to be an intelligent discarding of drugs. That was the goal, was to discard every drug. I think that's the way I read it. I think the Lord has the means to accomplish what needs to be accomplished in the care of human health. We don't know it, though. I mean, we, we may know it in theory, but we don't know the details. When I first started making this comment, I would contrast... Um, oh, boy, let's see if I can get the right terms here. Um, no, maybe I shouldn't even tell that story. Anyhow, we, we, there are things yet to be learned. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just cut the story and move to the, 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 the uh, chase, or the cut to the chase on this one, so to speak. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of any successful natural remedy. I, I worry about ones that don't work. <laughs> so let's be intelligent, but let's keep pushing in that direction. Going on. The greatest missionary work that can be done in our world is work in ministerial lines combined with medical missionary work. Greatest. That's a superlative. That's a pretty cool statement. The truth is going forth from the sanitarium at Battle Creek as from no other center in our world. 
Those who have stood up to criticize should instead have participated in the work, showing that they have been enabled by the Holy Spirit to understand that the Lord has used Dr. Kellogg as his man of opportunity to do a great and good work. There is nothing that converts the people like the medical missionary work. This work makes the path straight before us and bears the impress that it is of God. Jesus is in the work and he cannot be hid. So what do we make out of all this? <clears throat> we make that God is consistent. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He could not do it through words alone. He had to combine with it acts of mercy and healing. A combined ministry, preaching, teaching, helping, healing. That has been largely lost sight of. Now, there's an interesting, uh, interesting article. Uh, what was his name? Oh, I forget the gentleman's name. He was both a pastor and a physician. And he went looking for the history. Is the medical work a part of God's work down through the ages? And yes, it was. The Waldensians were known as, as um, along with all the other things they did, they were known to be the best physicians or among the best physicians. Um, you look at Wesley. He wrote a whole book on natural remedies. You know? Every time that God's work has moved forward with unusual power or unusual perseverance, it's been united with the, the work of preach the gospel, heal the sick. That's what Jesus sent the disciples out to do. <clears throat> so that's the good Kellogg. The principles that Jesus used during his life still worked 1,800 some odd years later. They worked enough to initiate the beginning of the loud cry. Unfortunately, Kellogg's story does not end on a happy note, partly through the mistakes of others, ultimately because he refused to correct his own mistakes, the doctor's irritation with the many times at fault ministers continued to grow. This led him to ignore correction from the spirit of prophecy and left him unprotected from the attacks of Satan. In time, he came to be more hopelessly tied to the devil than anyone else ever described by Ellen White that I've been able to find. We will look at some of that tomorrow. But this is the, this is the good Kellogg. This is the bright picture. This is the picture that tells me the loud cry is achievable today. And I would just like to throw out one, one interesting thought. I don't have the statement here. I should have put that in. I think it's volume, no. I won't tell you. I, I, I don't know where it is. But there's a statement Ellen White said that when we begin to work the cities as if we meant to give them the loud cry or give them the, the third angel's message, as if we meant to, give the third angel's message. When we work the cities as if we meant to give the third angel's message, Satan gets upset and cuts loose with everything he's got to mess up the world. He's nervous about cities. There's a lot of people in the city. And we might always think of them as being godless and irretrievable. And, and in many cases, that's pretty well true, I suppose. But you know what? Satan has a lot of unhappy customers in the city. And if we could show them something that was better, he's very protective of cities. That really struck me as interesting. When we begin to take, to begin to work the cities as if we meant to give the third angel's message, Satan reacts, and he reacts strong. He says, I don't remember the exact wording, but he cuts loose with everything he's got. He's worried about cities. They're his Achilles heel. Now, the loud cry began with the sanitarium and orphanage visiting nurses and the Christian help bands. How many of you attended a Pathways to Health event in recent years? You know what? Those things were shaking up cities. There was supposed to be a Pathway to Health last year in Indianapolis. Do you know why it didn't happen? Somebody scheduled the pandemic.
Could we be in the beginning stages of the loud cry? Could it be that pathway to health, amen clinics, all those other things that were going on, could it be that Lucifer's reacting? I kind of like to hope so. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a great, a great option. <laughs> Let's at least get back to where we were in 1892. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to leave you with today. Let's bow our heads for prayer, and then I do have some quick announcements and, and things to, to take care of. Father... We haven't seen the loud cry on the front page of the New York Times yet. But wouldn't it be nice if it had actually already begun again? We don't have the prophet to tell us, and I'm certainly not going to claim that mantle, but wouldn't it be nice? And Lord, it's achievable. You've told us what to do. You've shown us how to do it. We pray that you would firm up our resolve to do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Um, quite a number of you have asked for my email address. So I finally figured this is much faster than me trying to dictate it to you every time because either my slurring or your penmanship, somebody's going to get it wrong. So um, there is the, uh, the top line is my email address. The bottom line is my web page, which I will warn you, I have not touched for seven years. So the information that I'm giving out now is not on that web page. I would like to get it on that web page so that you could, I could deliver, you know, some of you asked for the PDFs of my presentations. I would love to get that to you. Uh, I'm going to try and get it on the web page. Or I may even talk to the audiovisual guys and maybe they can put a link to the PDF right on the, the conference thing so you could download the video and the PDF at the same time. That would be kind of sweet too. Um, people have asked about the books I've written. They are there on the screen from left to right in chronological order. Um, I will just mention that De Sozo is out of print at this point in English. It is available in translations to Romanian, Spanish, and Indonesian, but uh, it's a bit of a trick to get hold of them. Get in touch with me if you speak those three languages. Um, and it may be reprinted soon. I am hopeful that that will happen. Uh, the other two uh, have been available in the ABC. The last two have been available in the ABC. They are currently out of tactics, but have reordered some more in, as I understand it. So hopefully they will be available. Um, and <clears throat> in a, uh, a pleasant surprise to me, my employer on the last day of my work said, Dave, uh, you know, it's awful nice you're going away for three weeks. We're going to miss you. <laughs> but um, uh, he, he gave me a donation. He says, this is to help you with your ministry. He knows that my ministry consists of nothing more than my hobby of sharing things, but anyhow. Uh, and so he gave me a very generous donation, and I thought, well, that's really nice. What can I do with that? And um, since I have, I have no copies of De Sozo, they've been out of print, and I have not had any copies of my other two books for the last year and a half because shipping from the United States to Canada, there's some magic line in between there. You cross that, and the shipping goes up like three times. So I haven't done that either. But I did happen to have a supply of hindsights. And so if any of you are interested, not in this specific information, it's not going to be in there, but if you're interested in general lessons from Adventist church history, I have about 60 copies that I'd be happy to give you. So um, if you can, in some discreet and fair manner, come up, you can get them here. 